I was in third grade when one of my friends, uh, I would go over to her house and her father began molesting me. When I ran into this program, I thought, I need help. My husband agreed with me, openly, uh, that I need help uh, dealing with my sexual abuse. I remember loving it and remember it really impacting the areas of my heart that no one had ever touched. not always easy because we think we deserve and we do deserve to have a life that is free from harm but very few of us actually end up with that life. My father would have been a little bit of an Archie Bunker that, that for the, some of you who would watch Nick at Night today um, will give you context for my father's framework and view of family, which is women support men. And uh, so in ninth grade, I became a cheerleader, and um, which cheerleaders just cheer the men on, don't we? And that was my role. And I loved it. I mean, I loved my life. I just remember thinking I loved my life. Not that I actually experienced much of it because I was living on the ceiling, but I remember loving my life and loving the Lord and loving Young Life and a gentleman named Bob Leilightner who headed up the Young Life program under Colonial Presbyterian about 40 years ago. And that was my safe haven. And he really impacted my world and impacted that I could be all that I wanted to be. And yet what I wanted to be was a mom and a, a wife. And so out of high school, I moved in with my two brothers. I had two brothers, the one that got, that introduced me to the Lord and the one that broke his neck. And one took care of the other. Now, remember out of high school, moving in with them and taking care of my brother, Pat, for about a year. And in that time, I met my future husband. His name was Bob. And um, I was married at the age of 19. At the age of 22, we were helping pastor a church here in Kansas City called Kansas City Fellowship back in 1983. And, um, and so I was living my dream. I mean, not just my fantasy world, but actually my dream world. Um, and it became real, and I loved my life. And I had, you know, the 2.3 children. Um, I had a young boy and a young girl. And then about six years later, we adopted a young boy and uh, from a mom who was a crack addict. And so I had three children, and I was living life and loving it, still very disconnected from my own heart, because I lived sort of out here. Though I threw myself into pastoring, into helping, into loving people. Well, I loved people. I knew that. I knew I loved people. And I knew that I loved giving love to people. Um, ultimately, what would happen in that world was I would get my own internal needs met by loving people. Uh, unbeknownst to myself, that, that at some level, I was feeding off of those people which is slightly dis discouraging me today because I realized how much I fed off the sheep. But in it, knowing that God is faithful and He's kind, and, and I recognize that. And I even remember going back to some of them and apologizing. Um, but knowing that I just love to help people. And so when I ran into a ministry called Desert Stream, it was doing a program called Living Waters. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, they help those um, that deal with sexual brokenness. And for me, growing up in the Midwest, you didn't go to counseling back in the 80s. You didn't seek help. I mean, you know, I, again, I remember mentioning that my siblings all needed it, but it hadn't really had its impact on me. But when I ran into this program, I thought, I need help. My husband agreed with me openly, uh, that I need help uh, dealing with my sexual abuse. And I thought, I'm just going to take it for that. It's going to be fabulous. And I took it and I loved, I remember loving it and remember it really impacting the areas of my heart that no one had ever touched. And again, what it did was it showed me my childhood neglect, which was the dilemma of which I had to open up to and sort of had to see and once I did that, then it really, I was able to let the Lord into areas that I hadn't ever before. And I call it removing all that hinders love. 
that the Lord would come in. And my heart for people today is that the Lord, they would allow the Lord to come in and remove those things that hinder him loving them well and them loving him well and thus loving people well. And the traffic in our soul, the traffic in our mind often hinders us actually experiencing his touch and the feeling that he loves us. And so that it hinders us loving others well, um, because we know that the basis of us loving people well is knowing that he loves us well and that he, and that I can actually love myself and not be ashamed of who I am or what I came from. And those things are the cornerstones. And so I loved living waters because it helped me begin removing those things that hindered him loving me well and me experiencing that. It's a, it, back in the day, it was about, I did this 20 years ago. And so that changed. Literally, it was a paradigm shift for me on loving people and pastoring people. I'm still in a pastor and I've been doing it for really 30 years. But 20 years ago, it shifted the way I pastored and it shifted the way I understood how God pours in and how if we don't have containers, if you will, which I will call our hearts, if we don't have containers of which to hold his love, it sort of just seeps out. And we constantly need that idea of, does he love me? Does he love me? Does he love me? I no longer needed to grasp, does he love me? But I was able to contain, he loves me. Whether I was getting prayer or whether I was speaking to someone or whether someone was speaking to me or whether I was in a prayer meeting. I, you know, when we feel his presence and sort of we get in the car and drive home and then it sort of seeps out, it no longer seeped out. I could contain it. I loved that. I loved that I could contain it. And, and, and so I was hungry to help others contain the love that God had for them and to shore up their containers, if you will. And so much of those containers have to do with their mom's affection and relationship to us early on. And um, for me, I had a bottomless cup. I had no floor to um, the knowledge that my mom loved me. Again, not because she didn't love me, but because she didn't have tools of which to show that and didn't have tools of which to take me in. She was already overwhelmed when she had me. I know that sounds hard to believe. I'm a fabulous little girl, but she actually was overwhelmed because her life was already too much for her. And if I could objectify her world apart from mine, I could go, oh, absolutely, she had a hard time. And I could do that with no problem. What I needed to do was to say, though that was the truth, I still not deserved, but it was created to have her affection, was created with the need for her to love me well. And when I was able to separate those two and yet have one met without uh, dishonoring my mom, um, then I was able to, the Lord began to put a floor in my cup. And when he poured his love in, I was able to contain it. And so as an adult woman, I'm able then to house the knowledge and understanding that God loves me, really loves me. Not like the 10-year-old who believed that he loved me and hoped that he loved me, but never really felt it, but an adult woman who says he absolutely loves me. Whether I'm on a beach doing nothing, or whether I'm sitting in the prayer room, or whether I'm preaching to five or six hundred, or whether I'm giving out or not giving out. Um, he loves me and his love for me and my love for him makes me successful, not what I do or how I live my life. When I look back at my childhood and I look back at my relationship with my mom and my relationship with my father, I know I've not mentioned him much. He passed away when I was 14, so I don't have lots of memory of him. Um, I have to acknowledge as painful as it was for me, that their addictions, that their behavior towards me or their lack of behavior actually was wrong before the Lord and actually sin against me. Um, for some, I know for some, many have experienced far grievous sins as far as sexual abuse, as far as violence towards uh, them as people. Those are quite sinful and 
and egregious before the Lord. And when I realized that my freedom in my own heart and my ability to forgive my mom and to see her appropriately, not just see her as what I wanted her to be or see her, my mom and my dad, as I wish they were, you know, the, the Walton family, you know, um, the, the sweet family that loved their children well. When I, when I was able to actually see them appropriately, then I actually was able to deal with the bitterness that had been growing in me that I was not acknowledging to myself. And the reason I wasn't acknowledging it to myself is because I lived out here in a pretend world. And when I invited myself back to live in this body, um, I realized I was quite an angry little girl <laughs> as an adult woman. And I was angry towards my children. I was angry towards my spouse. And I was quite angry at some other people around me. But it was really more displaced anger at how I was treated as a child. And and so I had to start going on a deeper journey of not just understanding my brokenness, understanding my relational dynamic, but but knowing that um, that bitterness had found a root system. I mean, found a foothold in me as a root system. And as a pastor's wife, my husband and I had many times worked with people who ended up really bitter and their lives were really sad as they got older because they were mad at God, they were mad at the people around them. I think of how many of us, I'm 53 or 52, um, I'm a grandmother of three, soon to be four children. I have three godly children. But as I've grown older, I've realized that life didn't turn out the way I thought it would at 20. Life looks a little bit different than we think it's going to look. And what happens is because of that, because of the disappointments, because we don't end up with the honor We don't end up usually with the finances or we don't end up with the positions that we felt we deserved or we felt was due us or we felt we had earned. Um, We end up quite bitter. And Genesis says that bitterness is a root system that grows. And that root system that God says, he asks Cain, why are you angry? Why are you sad? And don't you know that if you would turn, all would go well with you? Um, and that if you don't turn sin, it lies at your doorstep and its desire is going to be for you. And I realized that God wasn't asking Cain, why was he angry? Because God was confused. He was asking Cain, why are you angry? And why are you sad? Which is really depression and oppression. Um, he was asking Cain because he wanted us to be aware of our internal makeup. That in Genesis 4, not in the New Testament, not in the end of the Old Testament, but at the beginning of the story, he was telling us to be self-aware. He was telling us, in fact, it says that God counseled Cain. And he was telling us that when we find counselors, we want to find good counselors who look at us and say, what is your root system of why you behave the way you behave? And it was so enlightening for me and so helpful because I understood that I had a root system of people who had treated me poorly and my response to them. And I had to work that out. And to work that out, I had to forgive my mom. I had to forgive my father. I had to forgive my abuser. I had to forgive the multiple young men in my life as a young girl who took from me what was not rightfully theirs. Um, I was a victim of date rape. I had to forgive these ones who actually took what was not rightfully theirs. And that was mine to do, not theirs. And that was complicated. It's not always easy. Because we think we deserve, and we do deserve, to have a life that is free from harm, but very few of us actually end up with that life. And so Tracy, myself, had to really connect with that I had the power within me to free them, which actually in turn freed me. And God says it's a root system, which means we don't see it very easily that we have to actually go into it. He was asking Cain, go into yourself, find out what's going on in your own heart, in your own mind, and have some self-awareness of how you're behaving. 
And in so doing, I will counsel you and and get some understanding for why we are angry, for why we are depressed, for why we are sad. And when we do that, he says that he, if we let them go, he will let it go well with us. And when I began to do that, my relationships flourished. My heart and the Lord flourished. I was able to invite myself to live in my body. Again, I know that for some you're thinking, that is so weird, but it's actually not. It is, I was able to live in my body happily with where my life was, that my life was actually good enough. It didn't have to be Walton's Mountain. It didn't have to be the BMW, the nice car, the, the nice house. It was that I could be happy being who I was. And that flourished on the inside. And then I just began inviting people into that freedom. And I've spent the last 20 years inviting people into the freedom of their own hearts, not that it ever freed them. I never had to trust my abusers again. Me forgiving them did not mean I had to trust them. Me forgiving my mom didn't mean that she was then justified in her lack. What it meant was Tracy could cut off a root system that stopped me from experiencing God's love. My husband was actually the biggest proponent of me um, sharing the world of living waters, uh, which is a world that helps those get free from sexual and relational brokenness. Um, he said, I think you found your ministry. I think you found what you love. And being a good sixth born, I didn't really want a ministry. I just tell me what to do and I will be happy is really um, my world and was my framework. Um, I don't know if any of you have older siblings, but if you're sixth of seven, you usually have any original thought squashed. <laughs> and so, um, and I did, I have all very strong uh, siblings, g unbelievable godly leaders, all seven of them or six of them. I'm kind of following them along. And so, but my husband encouraged me and said, no, you need to do this. And so I loved it. I just began leading in it and began teaching in it. And it, I was about seven to eight years into doing it when um, in the end, my husband left me um, after 20, 23 years of marriage. And so that was an extraordinarily traumatic event. Uh, my advantage, if there is an advantage in divorce, I don't think there is, but my one advantage would have been that I understood how to deal with pain. I'd had seven years of really trying to work it out and pursuing to work it out well. Um, it created a devastation in my children. My son became a drug addict. My daughter became suicidal for the next year. And my youngest at 10 sort of just lived in a world of his own making, which I sort of was recognizing as something I had done. But I remember thinking, but it's one less thing I had to deal with at that point. The other two were in such trauma. And I lived in two years of sort of stabilizing my world. And I began, um, at that point, I remember thinking, um, I had been a pastor's wife and I didn't really have any tools at that point of which to support us. And so I began cleaning houses which is a noble profession, uh, not one I grew up wanting, but a noble one nonetheless. And so I did that for a couple of years until my brother started um, a ministry called the International House of Prayer. Actually, he started it the same year that uh, my husband left me. And um, it was something we had worked towards. We had wanted to do the House of Prayer, which is a 24-hour House of Prayer in the, um, in the likeness of the Tabernacle of David. And um, and so I just remember thinking that would be my um, place of refuge. At the same time, I was sort of mad that his life was going well and mine wasn't. And uh, when I worked those out with the fact that it was not God's design that my life wasn't going well, but it was a choice of another human being that my life wasn't going well, which I know many of you are dealing with. You're dealing with the results of people's sin against you that had no doing on your part and no doing on the Father's part because that's not His design for our life. But we do live with the repercussions of people's choices against us and their free will to choose sin, which is extraordinarily painful. And when I worked that out, I got a counselor and I worked that out. Then I began sort of stabilizing 
and my life began to sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel, and my divorce became final, which is, I hate that word, to be honest. I hate the fact that I'm a divorced woman. Um, I just, because that just isn't in the heart of the Father for us. But when I realized that I would be okay as that, and that he would actually step into a role of taking care of me, not just like money from heaven and manna from heaven. I still had to do lots of things for that to happen. But as I partnered with him and began, and chose yes in the midst of trauma again, yes in the midst of trial, we get to choose yes. I get to choose to love God the same way I loved him the day before my trauma. Um, I wanted to love him the day after my trauma. I didn't want that love to be any different. I wanted to be able to say yes in the midst of pain, just like said, just like I was saying yes in the midst of plenty. And that was my heart's desire. And so in being able to do that and fighting for that, really, it's a fight. It's a moment by moment fight. But in the middle of doing that, then the Lord um, stabilized my world, honestly. And I began uh, working with the International House of Prayer in the area of the specialized pastoral care. I've been doing that now for 10 years, 10, 11 years. Um, it's been there for 13 years, and I'm now the director over the department that works with those dealing with sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, cutting, eating disorders, gender confusion, transgender. We sort of get to work with it all, which is, oh, I mean, I don't need a fantasy anymore because it's my it's my life. I love it. And who would have thought that I would have 10 years ago be doing what I'm doing today? And I think that that's the challenge of us uh, to look at our lives as 60 chapter books or yay 70 or 80 chapter books where one chapter might look ugly, but the next chapter can look completely different. And one chapter can look beautiful and the next chapter trauma can happen. And that we get to um, we get to really work out that just because this chapter is ugly doesn't mean the rest of my life will be ugly. And that that can sort of stabilize us in the midst of working it out, walking it out and working it out. And so for me, you know, chapter 52, chapter 53 is, is looking amazing. And the Lord has given me, um, a really a generation of young people that I can look at and go, you know what? Life is hard. Life is hard and then we die. That That's reality. Life is hard and then we die. And we get to go to heaven if we've said yes to Jesus. But life is not easy. I, I never want to be one that pretends that life is easy. It's complicated. It's hard. It's getting harder. It's getting darker. And but that God will actually meet us in those places and that they have a way out and a way forward of trauma, disappointment, of broken families, broken relationships, and their part in that, and that they can actually get free and they can actually live free from any addictions of which they acquired so as not to feel pain. Um, and so it is the joy of my life as I continue to deal with bitterness, um, as I continue to deal with unforgiveness just in our everyday lives, um, I continue to experience great freedom. And I, I continue to experience the Lord's actual love for me, regardless of whether, again, I'm talking to 500, giving a television interview, a radio interview, writing a book, whatever it is, or whether it's sitting there watching politics, which is my sort of private, well, actually quite open obsession. I love politics. Um, whether I'm just doing that or decorating my house or playing with my grandchildren, God loves me equally. And because he loves me and I love him back, therefore I'm a success. I'm not a success because I have a car, a nice house, or my children are acting normal, praise the Lord. It's that he loves me and I can actually internalize that and know that he loves me. And it doesn't matter if I lift another finger towards helping one more person, he loves me just as equally. And I love that. Like, I love that. And it's great gain for my heart to know that. It's an amazing thing to come to the knowledge that God's love is there for you to seek and find, and that it is His love that brings healing to your broken places. The Apostle Paul, who once was an avowed enemy of Jesus Christ, 
met him on the road one day, and his life was utterly transformed. He wrote, In love God predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ. And then he wrote, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. No matter what your question, your answer is Jesus. Everything that you need is found in Him. Every wound that you have can be healed in Him. Why not read the Gospel of John in the New Testament this week and discover what life is all about? Until next week, I'm Colette Burke for Pure Passion. God steps, I'm taking.